Podcast. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to the Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by the Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, CEO and founder, and I am honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through paying it forward and giving back. Ethical business owners and holistic healers who are determined to create collective change in the world. Once we have a change in consciousness and through collective change, we can become one. I found my next guest online and knew the moment I found her that yet another incredible connection was about to occur, despite the distance. Zipporah Kingsbury is a somatic intimacy and relationship educator and breathwork specialist based in Oregon, USA. She's also consulted as a love guru on TV's The Bachelor. Through the Redefining Intimacy Method, her work guides adults of all genders home to the place where they feel most connected, at ease in their body and grounded confidence in their self-worth. Through our discussion, it became clear that Zipporah and I had a lot in common, and I hope you also get some gold out of this conversation. Welcome, Zipporah, to The Ethical Evolution. Thank you, Bindi, for having me. I'm excited very much so for our conversation. Me too. Now, for those who don't know who you are, um, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah. So my name is Zipporah Kingsbury. I am a somatic intimacy and relationship educator and a breathwork therapist. And most often I'm working with business professionals who really got it going on professionally but they feel there's something missing in their personal world. They're really yearning for more meaningful connection and more intimacy. So I help them to not just develop confidence around emotional connectivity and intimacy, but to also feel safe um, in their body to regulate their nervous system so they can start interacting um, from a calmer, right, centered place in their life. Mm, That sounds so amazing. Now, um, you have an incredible story as well. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you're, you're known in a lot of places, um, particularly uh, in the US, you were on The Bachelor. Can you tell us about that? I, I chuckle at that because <laughs> I, I'll, share, I'll share the story from start through it. And um, I chuckle because I wasn't looking to be on a TV show. Yeah. They found me. So I'm saying that to people who want to, you know, they found me. They found me mm-hmm. because my stuff was out there. Yeah. But When I originally received the invitation to be on The Bachelor, I received a message saying, we're looking for a love guru. And like, what would you think if you received a message like that? I'm like, this is a hoax. You'd be like, yeah, right. Right? (laughs) Yeah, like this is weird. (laughs) Um, Went back and forth a few times. The the episode itself, we filmed in a place called Santa Fe, New Mexico in the Mm -hmm. States. And I was living in a completely different state but that was, it was all confused. They thought I was where they were shooting, where they were scouting. And the agreement that I had when we finally met, you know, they interviewed a bunch of people in my field, ended up choosing me. But the thing that I set in place was I'm not an actress. Mm. I said, I am coming on to be a consultant, Mm. to give a session to a couple and this is what I need to, to be able to agree to come on your show. Yeah. Um, and I feel so blessed because they agreed. They're, they We didn't cut. You know, I gave the couple uh, almost a two-hour session um, like I would give therapeutics to anybody else in my home office. And they cut, you know, what they wanted to and gave me 10 minutes of primetime TV, wow. which was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's a claim to fame for you. <laughs> right. And I will say the most, the most rewarding thing though, is what wasn't shown. And, mm. and I think that's often the case. Mm. Um, I was asked the other day, what was, what did I take away from it? And it was more so of what the couple experienced and their breakthroughs. Mm. 
because that wasn't shown on live on the television show. Yeah. Um, but that will always stay with me. Yeah. Some things have got to be kept sacred, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, you also um, had a background as a professional bodybuilder. I did. I did. I did. Um, I competed for, um, it was actually amateur. I competed, I was working towards becoming a fitness model. My, my, my dream was being professional um, or going further along as far as I could. Um, I did that for five years. And during the period that I was doing that, I didn't, you know, I talk a lot about emotional intelligence mm. And I will say in that time in my life, I wasn't as diverse in myself, like connected to my emotional intelligence. Yeah. I, I push, I, I'm a hard worker. Yeah. I can make anything happen. You get it. <laughs> you get that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So it was going into the fifth year of my bodybuilding, um, is that my body started feeling different. I, um, started having brain fog. I started getting really tired. Um, for those of you who are competitive athletes, you'll know what I mean is I was getting weighed in and checked in every week leading up to competition mm. and my body fat stopped dropping. And mm. that's a sign. This, my system was on overload, but instead of stopping, I pushed, mm. I could barely walk. Wow. Um, yeah. Put on 30 pounds in two days. And that was the pivotal point in, in my personal life and my career for sure. Wow. And, um, and that's how you led to where you are now, right? Yeah. If that didn't happen, I don't know where I would be. It's so that happened about a year after that happened, I ended up selling everything I owned, um, moved in with my mom for six to eight months to save money. And cause I Googled so weird. We find everything through Google. Don't we? Mm. It was, it was just like, I said, where can I go? I knew I needed to go for my own self-connection and work, and but I wanted to learn at the same time. And so I Googled something, I don't know, health centers, or I don't know what, I remember what I even Googled, but this school in the middle of the Swiss Alps pops up on my computer screen and my whole body, I don't know if you've experienced this, but my whole body was just like, that's it. Yeah. And I'm just like, I had not, at that point in my life, I was 29, never left the States in my life. And I was just like, and now I'm meant to go live in Switzerland. <laughs> wow. So, so mm. I did, I sold everything, saved money and off I went. And, uh, and you really, um, connected with yourself and, and, and that now has led you to the therapy that you do with clients, right? I did. I devoted my life to study of various practices. I'm not a one path kind of woman. I definitely studied various forms of therapy, um, Eastern medicine, Eastern healing, um, yoga, tantric practices. And I became celibate for seven years. Mm. And I will say that time period of study and celibacy, um, I, I chuckle because I often say it's what made me a better lover mm. and has definitely made me a better human because that to me is where intimacy is birthed from, from that depth of self-connection. Mm. Um, and it did, obviously it influenced everything I do now in my work. And you would probably see uh, now with clients, you know, a lot of people believe intimacy is only something that you have with someone else. It's not something that you have with yourself, right? Yeah. I, I, I call it, most people go to learn intimacy by numbers. Mm where we think we have to do a specific technique to be intimate, mm. right? We have to do an action. Um, I'm like the Mr. Miyagi, if, for those of you who've watched the old Karate Kid, yeah. I, I like the wax on, wax off yeah, method yeah. of intimacy yeah. because I find intimacy is a quality. Mm. It's a quality that has awareness, presence, sensitivity, and right, all those are born inside of us. So if we don't do that inner practice, the inner practices to cultivate, I, I think it's a sensitivity. We're not going to be able to feel intimacy. We can do the intimacy by numbers, but we're actually not going to feel it. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever experienced, like I can tell if someone's doing, whether it's touch or talking in a certain way, using a method mm. or actually feeling what they're doing. Yep. Yeah, totally. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it starts from within. I think it's just a really deep inner process. Mm. And I think, you know, and you were talking about being, you know, celibate for seven years and, um, you know, I also have been for about three years and, you know, I think that is, um, you know, a lot of people that would frighten them, it would scare them because being alone and um, not being in a relationship, um, they, they don't know how to be in a relationship with themselves. And I think, you know, if we can have that relationship with ourselves, I think that's the greatest thing you can ever do for anybody else you're going to be in a relationship with, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say like I, I was scared. I It took me to go as far as my body collapsing, putting on 30 pounds in two days and recognizing because I was forced in that moment to feel the most physical and emotional pain that I'd ever felt. I, I was 27 at the time, mm. right? So that I'd ever felt in 27 years of my life. And that showed me that prior up into that moment, I was living disconnected to myself. I was using sex and relationships to fill a void, Yeah, but I forgot who I was. Like I didn't feel that connection. So it did scare me, mm. but then I'm just like, I was forced to that point. Now I was like, well, what do I want now? Right. Mm. I, I, but I don't think everyone has to be forced to that extreme to take one small step into something that's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's almost like we have to have the breakdown to have the breakthrough, right? Yeah, we do. But like, I'm, my vision is to kind of reframe that. Mm. Like I have the breakdown to break through, yeah. but I don't feel we have to. No. I, right. I feel like if we can start to do the practices, like don't wait for therapy or counseling until something's not working. I believe everyone should have a coach or a therapist yeah. or a counselor while life is amazing mm. um, because it is about practice, right? And so if we can have someone, you know, by our side while we're taking one, maybe one baby step into something uncomfortable that we wouldn't typically do and start to reframe our own life patterns. Yeah, and that's something so important that you've just raised there is that we we don't need to wait for things to be broken to actually do something, you know. I think um, the big thing we need to remember is that we're not alone and and if you reach out for help, you're going to get it. Like just don't be afraid. Like and the, you don't have to think there's something wrong with you if you reach out for help. You're just being a better human. Um, yes. So I think if you can proactively, you know, it's a bit like – I always um, say to clients, it's a bit like, you know, driving a car. If you treat yourself like a car, you're going to maintain it, right? You've got to put fuel in it. You've got to maintain it. You've got to service it. Why do you not do the same for yourself, you know, on all aspects? So really, it's that proactive maintenance of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, do you want to be driving in the slow lane and then all of a sudden start to speed up and just feel like the loose nuts and bolts, right? <laughs> to feel the wobbly wheels. Yeah. Um, or do you want to, like you just said, keep the maintenance up, the oil changes and and have your, your car running maybe in the middle lane, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> steady and smooth. Um, so important. And I was just talking about this the other day and I want to share it with you is what if we actually felt for a moment what we were feeling? Mm. You know, we're taught that to feel is bad. We're taught that emotions are bad. We're taught we're not supposed to say what we're feeling. And there's a place where our, the fear in the mind, like those fearful thoughts start to go out of control. Like we start to have this manic mind because we're thinking and thinking mm. and thinking about the situation. We're trying to pretend it's not there and we're taking action anyway. So, you know, they say, feel the, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yep. So I have a different interpretation of that. Feel the fear, own the fear Acknowledge, like, I feel scared. Mm. Don't pretend you don't feel scared because the mind will hold on to control until we actually kind of give voice to it. At least that's my experience. Mm. Um, give voice to it. And then we get to have a conversation. All right, well, what does the fear need? Because obviously there's something that you need or that aspect of you needs that it's not getting. Mm. So if I'm, whether it's with a friend or a family member, rather than pretend everything's okay, it'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm noticing I'm feeling scared. 
And I still want to do this with you. And I still want to have this conversation, but I just wanted to bring voice to what I'm feeling. And then you might notice, wow, I feel nervous, Mm. right? The fear that had a grip might actually relax into nervousness. And now you can be like, okay, now I feel nervous, but I feel more open. So it's a beautiful process where, when our feelings have space to start to shift Mm. into something else. So we become more open um, in our experiences. Yeah. And I know for me, and and I know particularly for a lot of women, um, you know, around my age or even younger, um, they've gone through their lives for decades and not actually even understood what their feelings are or how to communicate them. Um, Like you're like, okay, what's going on there? Mm, I I don't know what the words are for that. (laughs) Um, You know, not actually connecting with what they're feeling. And I know for me, just a a few years ago when I started therapy, I was like, I I don't know what this is. I don't know how to communicate it. Now, ask me anything. I can tell you exactly what I'm feeling down to the cellular level. (laughs) You know, it is like if you get that connection with yourself and that awareness, like – you you get what's going on, you know, and you realize, okay, this is this is my experience, and what's it trying to tell me? I love that. Mm. I love that. Yeah, and, and and hearing what you just said, I think also I'm going to repeat myself a bit, but it's a reminder to people that it is a practice. Mm. It doesn't come easy at first. I created these wheels, these charts. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I'll share them with you afterwards. But charts that break down. Um, our feelings and needs based on, you know, our emotions and our needs based on what's happening in our life. And I have clients that still to this day, they carry those wheels with them into conversations. They sit on my couch with those, with those wheels. Great. Use them. It's practice because we're not taught to identify what we're feeling. What we do do is we talk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes about our interpretation and evaluation of the whole scenario but we never tell someone what we're feeling and we're needing. Mm. And I love that you got you like you are able to get to the core of this because if we are able to communicate to somebody in say a very upsetting situation, say we're triggered and something didn't go the way we wanted, if we can get to what we're actually feeling and needing, that's where we can strategize and have outcome. Mm. But until we are able to do that, whether it's our family members, our friends, or our partners, we're not going to have outcome. It's going to be more stressful because we're just spinning in that story. Yeah. Yeah, And there's so much unconscious stuff we carry. Um, You know, we carry this load that, you know, so long we don't know is impacting us. And it's not until something's triggered that you go, oh, and you have that breakthrough and you go, oh, is that what that means? And this is what I now need to do. Um, you know, and I think it's just having that awareness and, you know, as you probably know, the mind doesn't know the difference between reality and, and, and thought, right? So whatever you're giving it is what it's going to think is the reality, whether it is or not. So it's, we've got to be conscious of that stuff. Yeah. And one of the areas that, you know, you said the mind, it definitely plays tricks on us. It doesn't know. So what if we leveraged and gave it information of what we actually want? Mm. Because then it creates feelings in our bodies that, again, it would interpret as, well, this is happening now. And that's an area where we can actually reframe the nervous system. When I'm working with somatics is we work. So if we have talk therapy where um, we start to investigate how the mind is reacting to the situation or the environment. So in somatics, we work with how the body is responding and reacting to the situation. Mm. Um, So we develop what we call as a felt sense Mm -hmm. and um, being able to identify the physiological responses and then being able to investigate and go further into those. And what are those physiological responses in our body? What are the underlying emotional patterns? And then when we can give them space Um, maybe during a process or during like a session when I'm working with someone, when we can give them space and the nervous system space to act themselves out through the body and using different breath techniques, but allow say tingle or shaking, for example, and follow those movements through the body, this unwinding process starts to happen in the nervous system. And eventually we can gather information like the client or the person can gather information, you know, understanding their needs and feelings and also start to integrate those old emotional loops that are mm. stored in the body and the system. Wow, you must see a real difference in people when they can unwind that and let go. 
It's beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful. They just light up and glow and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So um, if, if someone comes in and has a session with you, now you, you do this somatic work and you, you use a lot of breath work as well. What, what's your process there? No. All right. So I don't, it's not a, there's not a cookie cutter way. Yeah. Um, I actually work in person and virtually cause I work with people all over the world yep. and it would look different, but typically I'm working with someone a minimal of three months. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason being is because you can go somewhere and feel really good and have like an aha, or you can create really sustainable change. I like seeing people through start to finish to really create sustainable shifts that they're just, they become it in their life, if that makes sense, rather than just doing the mechanics. So we typically meet on a weekly basis. They're doing a lot of home discovery processes. So it's kind of like going to the gym. They're with me as their trainer. And then they're going home and practicing and it's becoming muscle memory. And we do a lot of the unwinding together and then they're implementing. So it's a combination. We have somatic therapeutics. We have, we work with nervous system regulation. Um, breath work is a real foundation of all the intimacy based work I do. And then depending on the client, we then go into more of the interrelating skills. So you have clearing the body and working right with the nervous system and old trauma loops or emotional patterns. And then you have building the new skill sets to start to implement into your life, right? Because if we carry and walk in the world with um, certain looping patterns in our emotional body or habits, right, that's going to impact how we're relating to people. And so now we have to actually shift like communication skills, mm. how to interact with people, how to, how to learn how to listen, how to communicate those difficult moments, how to be more compassionate. Um, there's all this learning process in order to build, um, I want to say like, just really empowered relationships rather than codependency. Mm. So can you tell us, you know, through the work that you do with clients, like what kind of difference it's made for people? Yeah. So I will say most of my clients, because they are business professionals, um, very high performance, very focused, like go, go, go. Mm. Um, Some of the big things that have come out of is noticing more trust, like people around them and their loved ones have greater trust in them, mm-hmm. right? Because they're feeling more centered in themselves. Um, people being more personable with them because often the challenge with the clients that I work with is they lack the, the skill set or the understanding of the personal interaction, but they're really good in the work world where they're in control. And so I was just talking to someone a couple hours ago, people being more personable to them, feeling greater self-worth and who they are just as a person, um, having more loving relationships in their family dynamic, finding more freedom and expressing their voice, their wants and their needs, um, not out of based on like what their parents want or what Mm. someone else wants of them. So overall, it's creating some extraordinary relationships because they just feel more connected to them. And I just, I love witnessing that. So it's really, um, to a degree, people finding themselves, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Finding, loving, connecting to themselves. Yeah. Your work must be so rewarding. Yeah. Oh, my God, it is. (laughs) (laughs) And big smile. Yes, I love it. You're beaming. Now, what would you say is the biggest challenge in the work that you do and how do you overcome it? Biggest challenge. Hmm. One of the things that I find is a steady awareness that I have to have is when to step back. Mm. You know, I think there, it can be, there's this ease when people are ready and they're moving forward and they're going, but you know, while we're working in a space together, being really highly sensitive and aware when someone's system has to stop. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that's a challenge, but it's definitely just a real awareness that I'm, um, that I need to have, because if I'm midstream in a process, um, working with someone, whether it's through dialogue, whether it's through on a table somatics, um, whether it's over zoom, you know, their system might start to freeze or just get tight. You know, it, I say it must show up as tightness, mm-hmm. um, emotion, and at that point, we don't want to go forward. We want to give that space. Yeah. 
Um, and I, yeah, so just being aware of where to give things more space. Mm, yeah. I can relate to that one. Um, now, we ask everyone who's a guest on this podcast this question, and I'd be interested to see what your answer is. <laughs> can you define for me what being ethical means to you? Wow. <sighs> That's such a big word. <laughs> <laughs> that done. Oh. Mm. When I think of being ethical, to me, it influences my choices. Mm-hmm. And for me to ask Mike the question anytime I'm going to take an action or a choice, how is it going to impact? my ecosystem, Mm. the ecosystem around me. And what I mean by that is the people close to me Mm. could be in relationship with, it could be family, it could be coworkers, could be my dog, you know, the the, the people in community. So it kind of starts close and then it branches out to environment, Mm. um, to societal, you know, society, like where do I need to grow more to have more awareness there? So to me, that's the meaning. That's how ethical would influence my life. Mm. Um, and my thoughts on it, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to just add, if I may, I, I was listening to a speaker years ago um, and they were talking about product making mm-hmm. and what came out of them around ethical. It was every time we go to make a product, like if we're a company, if you're a company making a product, the question that you should have is the end result of this product how is it impacting the environment? Mm. Right? Mm. Like, it's just like when you start, you know, you think of plastic bottles or other things. When you start making a product, think about the outcome years down the road and how is it going to impact? To me, that's ethical. It's that ecosystem. How are things impacting? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, there's no, there's no wrong answer to that question. Um, but I, I love asking it because there's a different perspective depending upon your experience. So, you know, um, it does come back to every decision we make and that's what this whole mm-hmm. podcast is about is, is actually looking at those different aspects of, of how we can be ethical yeah. just in our little ways and making that a little change. I love that. Yeah. Now, um, what, what are you working on at the moment? What are your future plans? Um, what are you, what are you up to? Wow, summer's here, almost, <laughs> almost over here. What am I working on? So coming up um, in the late summer, I am bringing together, still organize it for the first time since COVID, um, an in-person VIP day for a select eight people um, to come to the Pacific Northwest Ooh. and work with me for an entire day. And so I'm excited for that, especially after being online for mm. almost a year and a half. Um, so that's kind of in the works, the creation works. And I'm trying to think, is there anything else big I'm working on? I'm not in the process of any books. I've already had three. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the big thing is getting more to in-person right now as as we go into summer. And I'm excited for that and making it safe enough for for people and to feel right for people. Yeah. And, you know, I'm nearly everyone I'm speaking to lately, particularly in the US, um, is very excited about things opening up and people being able to see each other again and, and do things in person. So, you know, um, it's it, it almost feels a bit weird, but um, it's, it's getting back to a new normal, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Now, Zipporah, if people want to find out more about you and uh, connect with you, how can they do that? Um, a couple of ways. So you can find me at ZipporahIntimacy.com. I'll spell it. It's T-Z-I-P-O-R-A-H, intimacy.com. They can find me there. They can shoot me an email. They can connect me if they want to learn how to work one-on-one with me. Um, that's what I'm up to these days is the one-on-one um, with clients. Um, they can also join me if they're on social media. Um, we have a private community over at Facebook called the Safe, Seen, and Confident Community. And what I love about that space is it's tons of free resources. Um, we bring guests into that space. We have live conversations three times a week. And you can also get a lot of support through that group. Yeah. Sounds incredible. Um, now, I've got the last big question for you, Zipporah. What's the change you'd like to see in the world and how can we bring it to life? My heart. (laughs) (laughs) Um, mm, Yeah, mm, the change and I would say my vision is to continuously create shame-free environments Mm. 
mm. where people feel safe um, to be who they are, where humans can have the skills and the presence to just deeply listen and to be available for one, uh, one another, even amidst our differences. Mm. And I've had a few conversations on this podcast with um, a couple of other guests um, and we actually talked about shame and, and we, we wondered what would the world be like if there was no shame? Could you imagine yeah. it? Wow. Even if we just talked about it, mm. you know, what, what, what if we just like felt it and owned it and had these spaces to talk about it, right? So like you just said, so it has space to move or um, that we can be, and this might sound really weird, but be in relationship with our shame. Yeah. And right? I, I think. Does that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of us don't recognize that it actually is shame. You know what I mean? Like, they don't want to admit it. It's a denial. So, yeah, imagine if it didn't exist at all and we didn't have to experience that. Yeah. What yeah. a world it would be. <laughs> what a free world it would be. Yes. <laughs> um, now, Zipporah, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the ethical evolution. It's been absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I loved it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution podcast. If you're an ethical business owner, change maker or holistic healer who's determined to make a change in the world and you need support to spread your message, visit ethicalchangeagency.com to collaborate. Welcome explorers of the human experience. This is Let's Talk Soul and I'm your host, Claudia Monticelli. We're not afraid of the great mysteries of existence here. Soul versus consciousness, we're on it. Spirituality versus science, we've got that covered too. Join us in navigating these profound topics with wisdom, curiosity, and a dash of audacity. Whether you're a spiritual veteran or just starting your journey, Let's Talk Soul is your passport to the unknown. Let's Talk Soul, diving into the depths of the human spirit. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, that's the no, that's just my dad. My name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric acid. Electric acid.